we're going to come back together. To get going today, I would love to hear maybe just from a couple of you what came up, how have you experienced healing or liberation or freedom at New Abbey? Anybody down to share? Yeah, coming your way. Microphone, here I do. Now a hand over here, we want to make them work. Hi, my name's Angela. This is my second service here. Um, but as soon as the first service was over, which was Easter, um, I was happy to call this my home. Um, I was raised in the church. I can't really tell you like when I started going to church because I always remember it. Um, but walking in this church and seeing everyone here, it's so inclusive and the last church I came from was called One Two Church, One Love God, Two Love Others, and that's what this church is, and it's just so inclusive, and I think there's a lot of church hurt out there for those reasons, and I think this is one of the most accepting churches I've ever seen, so I think there's a lot of healing in that. Yeah, thank you for that. I thought you were going to drop the name of a previous church and talk some shade, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. but if anybody wants to do that, just raise your hand. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Give Others? me one reason. A couple stories. Yeah, Joy. Are any of you raising your hand back here? Because I'm going to look back. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joy. Um, I've been here since 2018. And the cha the, this place has changed a lot. Um, but what hasn't changed is that everybody here is um, trying to hold on to some type of hope. <laughs> and... Um, that's what this space has helped me do. This space has helped me pay my bills repeatedly. Mm -hmm. This space helped me come out. Um, and I don't think I would be really like here or alive if it wasn't for New Abbey. So it 100% has transformed and healed me. And it's because of the bodies sitting here in the, these seats, even though it is really like a transient space. And some of my friends who used to go here in the beginning aren't here anymore. Um, everybody that I meet like is so um, loving. And so, yeah, I'm here because this space is here. That's great. You've been here a long time. And I love you. I'm grateful that you're here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tierney. And um, this feels like the first Christian community, the first church that I get to show up to without having to hide a part of myself in the car <laughs> before I show up. Um, I get to be all of me. And I, the first time I came here on the way home, I said to my husband, I think that was the first time I felt Jesus in church. Mm. And so it just, it's just really, it's just really beautiful to be here. I feel, I feel God in this place. I love that. I forgot in this place too. In reality, I would love to make a day where we can go around and just share everybody's stories because I believe that's what the church is. It's you all. It's your narratives. It's the life that we're sharing together. And we're just at a place in New Abbey where I'm interested in where we're going and where we're going is commitment. That when I hear stories like this, what I know about this place is that God is doing something fresh in this place. That there are beautiful things going on. I'm not the kind of person who's like, and God's doing something here and not anything over there and all those places are evil. No, that's weird. Like, I grew up in those kind of churches. My aunt grew up in the church where those 200 people there were the only people going to heaven. That's a lonely place. No, what I believe is that there is something special here. And I just want everyone who needs New Abbey to know about it. And your narratives matter. There are other people who need this place, and I want this place to be here 10 years from now so that people can be in their life, that they can experience God, that whether you've been here for a couple times or you've been here for six years, that there's something that is for you and liberating you and healing you and transforming you. And then the next step, and this is where we're at, is also maturing you. But if I'm going to ask for a commitment from you all, which I'm going to do, by the way, then you need some clarity for that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was having dinner with somebody in our community, 
and I'm doing this leadership cohort with a bunch of you on Tuesday mornings at 7.30 a.m., praise God. And this person wisely was like, let's have dinner first. So we have dinner to get a little clarity on what's going on. And so one of the great things about being a pastor at New Abbey is just I just love everybody's stories. And I make no assumptions about anything. Right? I just kind of need to hear some things out sometimes. People are sometimes like, hey, do you know if that person's into me? I'm not even sure what that person's into, so I can't fully answer that question for you yet. Just give me a little bit of time. So this person begins to tell me their story and tells me the story of, by the way, this person gave me permission for this, um, and says, okay, I was at another church. It's a big church. You know the name of it. And then I kind of got the boot. I'm like, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, that sounds traumatic. You were there for a long time, like 15 years. You're really invested in this place. And then she begins to say, well, when I was there, I had met these two women, and we got really close, and then I ended up marrying them. I'm like, well, I could see why that conservative church would boot, boot you for that. doesn't feel like, yeah, okay. So I'm listening, listening. And then I, like, I have really bad hearing in, like, public spaces. So I'm like, I just want to clarify, you said that you married them, right? She's like, yeah, I married them. I'm like, okay, okay. So we're talking more and just kind of getting into her story, and then, and then she, she brought up these women and their relationship and, and the way that they invested in one another and how they got booted originally from helping out inside the church. So eventually they're, they're put into this parking lot ministry. And that like, we're like 30, we're just going with the story, right? And then eventually, I'm like, well, how did you hear about New Abbey? She's like, okay, well, these women who I married, they, they told me about it. We came for a while in COVID together. Um, but we never like really, it was COVID, so like it was online and we didn't really stick out. I'm like, well, where are they now? I feel like you married them. She's like, well, they ended up moving to Arrowhead. I'm like, they left you and went to Arrowhead? She's like, yeah. I'm like, how, are you okay that they left you? Like, I'm like shocked and broken. And she's like, I officiated their wedding. I was like, honestly? That is not where I have been going for the last half hour. I have been preparing myself to talk about your polyamorous relationship, these two women that you fell in love with at church, and of course your super conservative church you came from was not interested in that, right? They're still trying to pray the gay way. Let her out the polyamory that somehow you're interested in. I've been a pastor of this community so long, that's what I'm thinking, right? I'm like, I'm just trying to hear you out. I'm just trying to understand where you're at. And then I have this heart, like, I have a deep moment of empathy. I'm like, they just left you in a mountain town? You lost your church and everything, and now your loves are gone? This is too much. It was too much for one person to handle. Rick Warren is not telling that story this morning, just so you know. I got a lot of clarity in that moment. And I think that we all need clarity in life for whatever we're doing or whatever we're about, about who we are, about the places that we're a part of. And today I hope that we can find some clarity about who New Abbey is. Because I think at the end of the day, if where we're going is to heal and transform our own lives and the world, then we're going to have to commit in some different ways for this place to keep going. Uh, and so to talk about commitment and clarity, we're going to talk about some things. We're going to talk about Sozo. Uh, if some of you are from Bethel, you're like, it's not that, so don't worry. Um, that's like an inside joke for seven of you. You're welcome. For the rest of you, move on. Uh, if we can talk about a sozo, then we're going to talk about commitment issues. If we can talk about some commitment issues, then apostles' teachings talk about a good time. And if we can talk about the apostles' teachings, then some awe and wonder for you on a Sunday morning. If we can do that, then a little bit of fellowship and a little bit of finance, because without alliteration, where would the good evangelical little boy be in me? And if we can do that, then who? And if we can do that, well, then we've got to determine a relationship with one another. Um, if we're going to do this thing. Follow along with me in Acts chapter 2. This is my waterproof Bible, by the way. I've had a waterproof Bible for most of my life. There's a lot of mold if you open up these pages. Um, I never bring it, but this morning I need it. And you don't need to know. That's just my waterproof Bible. I really love it. I read the Bible in the shower a lot. So if you need one, go on Amazon. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, 
they were cut to the hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Let me pause here a second. What's going on is that we're in the book of Acts. Luke and Acts go together. Luke and the other gospels are the story of Jesus and Jesus' life and teachings and death and resurrection. You know that in some way, but at one level you need the life of Jesus, but then you need to actually practically work that out. The book of Acts is practically working that thing out because we've all had that moment and I'm going to pick on you a little bit. You've been here for two, right, two different times. You're like, I love this place. And then you're here for a while and like, oh, we got to work out shit together. Join us, right? And that's just life. You fall in love in a relationship. You get excited about a thing. You're like, I'm all about Jesus. But then you and those people got to work some stuff out together. And that's the book of Acts. And they didn't always work it out together well. So Jesus has ascended, gone somewhere else. The church is figuring out who they are in this life and ministry in the power of Jesus. Holy Spirit is with them, which Jesus is trying to say, you are the temples of God, right? You don't need the temple anymore. You got to go live into this world in a different way, in the empire that you live in, with the other powerful religions that you're a part of, not much different than the world that we live in today in, its, in those larger narratives. And now the church is sorting it out. And what the church is really interested very early on is that there's a conservative majority going on in Israel at the time. Sound familiar? And this conservative majority has a little bit different version about who God is. And this conservative majority is very interested in a certain set of exclusivity about who God is. This conservative majority participates in this exclusivity because they believe that the Bible says something else about who God is and they are not interested in this new Jesus progressive group of people who have a much more inclusive story about who God is and want to open this thing up outside of that conservative majority. I know none of this sounds familiar, but just try to track with me. So Peter is now speaking to the conservative majority because they've all shown up. The speaking of tongues, kind of fire, Holy Spirit, whatever moment has happened. And people are there and Peter is telling them the good news of Jesus, but he's using specific language for the conservative majority. That they may hear a story that is familiar to them and so that they might be invited into a broader good news about who Jesus is and what God might be interested in doing in the world. And so this is where we're at with Peter. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many others he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Pretty normal Sunday at New Abbey. That was such a bad joke, but thank you for the pity laughs. <laughs> Even better. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If we're going to be committed to something, you need to know why. The why is in the last part, and it's in the word being saved. The word being saved here is a Greek word called sozo. Say sozo with me. Sozo. Classic cheap pastor trick just to make you say some Greek words. Great. Sozo doesn't mean just saved as you think of it, which you were probably told that you were being saved because you're a depraved, horrible sinner because Adam and Eve ate magical fruit, and now you've got to deal with it today. Great. I know that's a story. Get over it. Let's tell you a better one. This is a story about you being transformed and you being healed and you being a part of the maturing and the changing of the world. That's what Jesus is interested in. What Jesus is talking about, I will take a breath here soon, I promise, is a saved, and this is what the word actually means, to heal or to make whole. Jesus is interested in the healing and the making whole of the world. It's not that you're a depraved sinner that needs rescuing. It's that you need help integrating to become whole, and that's the thing that brings about wholeness in the world and healing in the world, that when you're whole, you're fully connected with God and you're connected with other human beings. That's what Jesus is interested in. That's the type of kingdom that Jesus is bringing. You all shared some of those stories just a little bit ago about some of that wholeness that you're moving towards, that you have experienced sozo in this place. That there has been transformation, that there has been healing, that you are being made more whole, and that's the thing that you're interested in. 
I would assume that if I went around this room, we would agree with one another, that's the why that I want to participate in. I want more sozo in this world. Sometimes when we watch the news or we're on social media, we buy into the cheap tricks of polarization where we want enemies over there and boo on them, DeSantis, whatever, you pick your person. But we do that in some ways. I just did it there because we're making enemies of something. Jesus is saying, no, 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 I want that thing to be whole too. So that when you show up to Thanksgiving, you all can live a different kind of life together. So that when you raise kids or watch other people because they're crazy enough to raise kids, you can see that they're going to live into a different world than you're going to live into. I think we can all agree on the why. That this Jesus story is inviting us to a broader why that works for all of humanity, easy to say, and will be difficult to live out. And if we can understand the why, then we can get into some more specific questions about what's next. So I want to go back to the top of the passage in verse 36, and it says this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Jesus is talking to a conservative majority, I mean, not Jesus, Peter is talking to a conservative majority of his time. We have a conservative majority in our time as well. So we have a why for a broader, more inclusive gospel of Jesus that has the ability to transform the entire world in which people are not excluded because they simply want to be who they are as a human being. That's the good news that we're trying to live into. That good news always has to be lived out in a win. For this win 2,000 years ago, a win at a particular place in history and time, there was a conservative majority who was not interested in the story of God getting bigger and more inclusive. Like most conservative majorities in the history of world, you are not interested in that because you will probably lose power. You might lose identity, and there is an unknown there that is at times very scary. Now, many of you know that because you have been there at some point. And you have evolved and you have grown and you've seen other people grow and evolve into a broader and more inclusive story of good news and what Jesus is doing. We are in another win in a time and place in history where there is a conservative majority. And I'm not here to say they're evil, bad, malicious, whatever. What I'm saying is I have hope that there's a bunch of people who already have a narrative for God and that God is a part of a bigger reformation that is taking place in the 21st century because of technology, because of social media, where people will begin to hear of a broader story of what God is doing and that thing will change and transform the world. It will start Start small, but it will get bigger, and it is already happening, and we are a small part of that. That is what my hope is. And my hope for that is that doesn't just radically change a few places in the world. My hope for that is there are things that the conservative majority is doing that I believe are actually destructive to the world. Just like I believe that there was a conservative majority 2,000 years ago who crucified Jesus. And we live in a world with transphobia and homophobia, right? And with particular types of structural racism that destroy people's lives. We live in a world where a little boy can't show up to a neighbor's house without getting killed. We live in a world where people are getting shot in nightclubs and at schools. We live in a world where my nine-year-old comes home from school the other day, and I didn't even know that they have active shoot of training at his school. I found this out because they tell them that a bear might come, because we live kind of near the foothills, and so, but my older kid knows now what's going on, and the alarms went off in school the other day, and my nine-year-old has to come home and tell mom, I was scared because I thought there was a shooter in my school. This is the world that we live in. It is a real world. And I believe that there is a conservative majority who wants the world to look a certain way, not because they're evil, but they're conserving something that works for them. And what I believe Jesus is inviting us into is to open this up and to say, but what about a world that works for everybody? That's just the baseline for what it means to be a Christian is that you accept that every single human being is made in the image of God. That is our baseline that we start from. We did not make that up. That is what we believe that the scriptures are teaching us. That it's not just for a few Jews or a few conservatives or pick your time in history, but this story is for everybody. So the win really matters here. 
The time and place that we're in, at in history really matters here. So if we can agree that the why matters, and if we can agree that we're in a place of when, that there needs to be a bigger narrative so that people can experience the why, well, now we got to ask the harder questions. Well, what about the what? How do we actually do that? How do we go accomplish these things in the world? Because... We live in a time and place over the last 20 years, we've seen a bunch of different groups pop up to try to do it in different ways, right? And it's hard to get everyone on the same page. We have Occupy Wall Street and Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter. We can go through all the different groups and all really, really good things. And one of the difficult things about a lot of liberal movements that have started up is how do you keep these things sustainable so that the very good things that they're talking about actually transform the world? I'm not here to answer that today. I don't have all of the answers for that, but I do believe this that the church has the ability to answer all of those things at the same time as our lives transform and heal. That as our lives transform and heal, we have the ability to change the world in a really powerful and beautiful way. And I don't mean the world world, I mean this world. I mean the people around you. I believe that your life can be better and more whole and good and that that thing is interesting and helpful to the places that you'll actually show up on planet Earth. So the story goes on and it talks a little bit more about the what that the early church was asking questions about the what, and we have to answer questions about the what, but I think it's all there together. The problem before we get into the what is let me just name a reality that's true of New Abbey. Y'all, we have commitment issues. We just do. There's a bunch of hesitancy in this place. And there's hesitancy in this place because many of us have experienced a more powerful, more robust view of this good news in Jesus, but man, the story's over here of that conservative majority that we came from, it feels like too much, too daunting. I trusted over here. I gave over here. I put my time and energy over here, and I still feel hurt by it. Here's a definition of commitment issues for you. Commitment issues caused by fear of being suffocated, being hurt, settling, FOMO. By the way, this is about relationships. This is also about the church, right? That I'm gonna be suffocated by this place. There's, there's more to my life now, I know that. I used to be at that church and I gave everything and I volunteered like 30 hours a week and I did all of this stuff and now I'm a bigger human being. I totally understand that. Fear of being hurt, I get it. I do get it. I've been there. I know that many of you have been there. I know a lot of people have been there. Just feel fear of settling. But what if this is not enough? Fear of missing out or a result of trauma from a bad relationship. I can name and I'm happy to point out the reality that many people in this room, including myself, have trauma from a previous church in a previous place, right? Or just previous unhealthy boundaries. So I wanna name the reality of commitment issues that is just true and the hesitancy that we have. But let me also name this. If we don't grow through our commitment issues, then the why will just cease to exist. And I believe that. Because what I do know about the world, and this was true 2,000 years ago, the conservative majority was that, voice crack, was a majority. They have tons of power, tons of money, tons of things. And there's always been revolutionary, powerful renamings of the narrative of Jesus that have happened in this world, and they started small, but they had to grow. And they grew because people were committed to it. That's just the reality of planet Earth. And I believe that there are special things happening here, and I believe that there are special things happening all over the world right now, and I believe that we're a part of something bigger. That I believe 100 years from now, when people are at First Church of Mars or wherever they're gonna be, <laughs> that they're gonna tell stories about little places like New Abbey and said, man, they were some of the first people who told me and sh more importantly showed me that I could be fully who I am and I could still be a follower of Jesus. I could ask all of those questions and I could still be a follower of Jesus. Sometimes I think that we forget the reality that just imagine what life was 10 years ago. Pick a particular group of people, whether you were the people who were just asking questions because you read a Rob Bell book and you've like, for the first time, you're like, maybe hell's not real. Or maybe it was more particular to your life and you're like, man, I never had anyone, never was able to go to church where queer people modeled being queer and Christian for me because I was given a different narrative. I had to pick one or the other. That is happening in this place in a different way. And maybe we never forget that, the reality of what is actually already happening here. And that hopefully as time goes on, even though it's difficult right now, even though people are literally killing Jesus, and what I mean by that is they're killing the image of God in the world, which we say no to, which we say that there's a bigger story out there in which we never kill the image of God in this world. In fact, we want that image of God to thrive, and the diversity of that image of God is actually what tells a better story of who God is. We are practically a part of that thing right now. 
And what the, old, the church did 2,000 years ago is things that we step into today. The first thing of the what there is, it said that they followed the apostles' teachings. Here's the deal. What that means in the old world is the apostles were simply people who saw and experienced the resurrected Christ. That there were people out there who experienced and encountered something that was beyond them, and they began to name that thing, saying that that thing has a bigger story for what it means to be human. That's something that I hope that we never lose here. We name that as Jesus because Jesus does two beautiful things in a world like ours. One, is it still personal? It's still something you connect with. It's still something you can taste, see, feel, smell, and enjoy. And it's also universal. That's the beauty of the Christian tradition, is that Jesus holds both. You can have the personal, you're, you're there, and that's what you need, and name God. That's still important to me. That's still something that I connect with. And I know there's so many people in this place who are like, I'm not sure if I fully connect with that specificity of something. Well, great, Jesus is this universal Christ that holds all things together. That the best of what you find in other religions and other traditions, we call that thing Christ. And isn't that the power of the story that we're telling? We're saying that this Jesus, this Christ, holds a narrative for us that we need to keep coming back to in the most practical ways because the teachings of Jesus show me things. Shows me how to forgive. Shows me how to get through betrayal. Shows me how to deal with an enemy. Shows me how to love human beings that I think that they're not like me, right? The stories of Jesus, oh, there's a Samaritan. Jesus says, let's go hang out with the Samaritan so you learn a bigger picture of what God is doing in the world. When people are hurt or in need or their stories aren't whole, Jesus says, oh, that person's demon-possessed, let's go near them. Oh, that person, no one's allowed to go near them because of whatever cultural values of that time, let's go near them. That Jesus is teaching us new lessons in this world today, and I want to participate in that with all of you. And here's why I say that. New Abbey will come and go. Sometimes when pastors get up here and they tell you a vision of their church, they talk as if their church is the only thing happening on planet Earth. We're not. But I care that if you're here, that you're giving it everything like it is. That's the only way that it moves forward. This thing may fold up shop one day. And all that I hope for is that you are better when you leave than when you found it. If we do that, then we are doing everything right. Whether it's a day that you just exit naturally, it's a day that maybe this thing is just done. I hope that New Abbey transforms and changes your life. And how New Abbey will trans and change trans change and transform your life is because you were actively committed to this place and the life and stories and teachings of Jesus in this place and you transformed other people around you. That's what I believe. And then it says that they were not only committed to the teachings of the apostles, these bigger stories about Jesus, but they were also all about awe and wonder. What I hope for you living in 2023 is that there's, if there's ever been a narrative about God that felt too small, great, get rid of it. What they were going through 2,000 years ago is they kept seeing God show up in new ways. Maybe for us in the church today, it's not that when I walk by somebody like Peter, people are healed. Although if that happened, that'd be incredible. It's more of a story of you're witnessing it in each other's lives. You're witnessing it and that we can hold tension and we can hold questions and we can hold difficulty and we can hold conflict in a way that maybe you couldn't before. That is a miracle, by the way. The stories that some of you just shared is a miracle, by the way. And I believe in that in this place. And so would we keep opening ourselves up to a bigger story? Will we be committed to the stories of Jesus as part of the what and the way of following Jesus as, as personal, as universal as you need that? And will we be open to a bigger reality of God and the awe and wonder that comes with that? And then now for more specific, it moves to the ground floor. It says that they were committed to fellowship and they were committed to selling each other's possessions and giving it to one another. Most of you are like, ha, 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 joke's on you. I'm a millennial in LA. I can't afford land. Well, I get that. <laughs> I know it hurts, but it's reality. And part of what we're committed to here is both. You're going to have to do community. We're going to have to do community. I know that we might be hesitant, but it's interesting that every coffee and beer and breakfast and dinner that I have, I hear people saying, I want relationship. I want to be known. Oh, man, but I'm so hesitant. I got all these hurt shirts and traumas, whatever. We sabotage ourselves all the time around here, New Abbey. We just do. And I think for 10 years, I've been scared of just saying it. I have sabotaged myself around here. I've let other people tell a narrative that's not the narrative of who we are. We are going to be committed to a way of Jesus. We're going to name that thing. We're going to live out that thing. We're going to be about that thing. And we're going to open ourselves to a bigger story of God. And we got to commit to some stuff. And when I look around this room, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that 
man, we had such a beautiful lunch the other day with your kids and we were at your house and that was incredible. Jaime, I mean, the amount of times that we've had just really personal conversations, joy, the way that I've seen all of that you've shown up so many different times in New Abbey in different seasons, the heartache that you've come through, what you show and what you encompass for this community. And I could go on and on. Teams, oh my goodness, you are just stable, consistent people who show up and commit and you give yourself and you sacrifice in every way for this community. Tanya and Arlene, I can't tell you the hug that I get from you every single Sunday. That's what this place means to me. And if you want this place to transform you, you're going to have to show up. And let me be honest with you, and if you don't show up because you're hurt and you have trauma, I get it. It's just not going to transform you in the same way. I don't know how else to tell you that. And partly I know that because it's like everything else in your life. We were talking about this morning upstairs with a bunch of people who were taking the intro to New Abbey class. If you want a six pack and you never work out and change your diet, and if a year from now you're like, I just don't see why the six pack's not coming. I do. <laughs> and I get that your previous CrossFit gym hurt you and I get that that yoga class was too much. <laughs> they were called Soul Cycle for the love of God. <laughs> and I take that so seriously. And we are committed to helping you find therapy, to showing you a better way, to caring for you, to listening, to not minimizing or demeaning that. We're going to do all of that because there's going to there's have to become a day that you commit as well. Because if we don't commit together, we're not going anywhere. So we commit to community. Not like, I like the idea of community when I'm here on Sunday, but then like when a new Abbey does an event or it has to be a small group, like I'll wait till the last minute until a better offer comes up, which a better offer will come up because you live in Los Angeles and not Toledo. So you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to choose. If you really want this place to be a place that's a community for you, you're going to have to sacrifice. There's no other way around it. I wish there was. I also wish that I could have abs, but I don't do anything. <laughs> so at some point, I can be mad about that, or I can say, i got to participate. And we can do both. That's what I love about this place. We can name the healing. We can name the trauma. We can name all of the reasons that you have hesitancy. And we can go do the work of creating something better and more beautiful together. Thank you. That is a, amen. Yeah. And now your money. <laughs> they sold everything that they had. They had something. You have something too. And I literally mean like dollars and cents. I don't know how to say this any other way. We just live in a world of capitalism. This place will not make it without dollars and cents. And there are a bunch of people in this room who sacrifice financially. I wish I could not tithe, but I have a Texas grandmother in me that can't escape. <laughs> and here's the deal. There are many times where I would love to not tithe and go to Hawaii, probably like twice. But I don't, because I'm committed to this place. And if we're going to go on as a church, you're going to have to be. And people have been around here a long time, and I'm honestly at the place where I'm just going to start saying it. If you're not giving anything and you've been around a while, what it shows me is you're really not into this place. I'm not saying give everything. I'm saying just a buck that says, because I'm here. Because I ate a donut. Because lights are on. Because people are watching my kids for 90 minutes for free. It's not free. And if we're going to be here 10 years from now, we're just going to have to give. The early church was there because people were just like, well, I got a house. And like, the conservative majority has all of the money. So if we're going to be a thing, and if we're going to tell a better story of God, I'm going to have to give some too. There's a church that's in Dallas that I know of that's one of the biggest churches saying some of the wildest shit about transphobic this and that, whatever. You know what their operating budget was last year? $150 million. I can give you so many of those stories. This is not a story about me convincing you and manipulating you into this right now. Here's the deal. Don't do it. That's fine. But I just believe that if we're going to become something, we're going to have to sacrifice with one another. There's just no other way around it. And so if we want to see that story change, if we want to see that, you know, 100 years from now in Mars or whatever, it's going to happen because a bunch of people are like, I committed to showing up, I committed to these people, and we just live in a capitalistic world. Hey, they didn't even live in a capitalist world, but they knew it. And they're like, and I had to get something. Because people got to eat, there's got to be people that do have certain jobs, and we need the resources to make this thing go on. So that's my ask, New Abbey. Are we willing to do all of those things? Are we committed to the apostles' teachings, this bigger story of Jesus that holds the particular and the universal? Are we committed to awe and wonder, saying, hey, there's a bigger story of God out there, which is interesting to me, and I believe that this place has the ability to do that, not only with all the crazy fun stuff that's happening just on planet Earth and that we have, like, new telescopes that see to the end of the universe, but also within the de depths and the scope of my own life. 
I'm committed to fellowship and finances, to the people here, to showing up, to giving some dollars, because I think that this place is worth it. And part of that is, there's still going to be some of you in this room with hesitancy. And what I'm hoping for is that there's enough of you, though, who say, I'm committed. Because I do believe there's going to come a day when they're ready for it as well. And we're going to have done our work so that when that time comes, you can flourish in this thing as well. And I realize that maybe not everyone's ready for it. But here's the final thing. You know the why. You know that we're in a particular season of when. You know the what's of how it's actually like practically going to work. And by the way, that's not like a mystery. That's literally every church and every organization. Pick a government, pick a thing for the history of time. People don't show up, give their energy and their money and build relationships. It's just not a thing. But the who is you. That's what I believe in. It's not some mythological who out there. It's you. It's your story. It's your narrative. It's your particularities. It's what you have going on. When I say the who is you, I think about that for my kids, seeing your life and your story, that my children hang around you. I am sacrificing the most precious thing in my life. And that's not like, oh, Corey, that's so amazing. No, I'm saying, but that's what I'm committed to. And 10 years in as the pastor of this place, I think where I'm at now with hesitancy is, I just want to know that you're there as well. That if I'm going to give them my all, I want to know that you're going to give it all. And that's going to look different and be different at different seasons, and that's okay. This is not a conversation of, you're not doing enough, give more, shame on you, feel more guilt. This is a conversation of, I believe in here, start somewhere, let's do this thing together, transformation is happening. Imagine what it would look like if we could get over our hesitancy, and imagine if we could tell a bigger story that would change our lives and the people around us' lives as well. That's what this is the story of. I believe in you now, Abby. I believe in us. I'm ready to give, get over our own stuff. I'm ready to grow. And hope that you're in it with me. And if you want to be, here's what you got to do. Write one check for $10,000. <laughs> email me. This is my personal email, Corey at newabby.org, and I'm going to get back to you. But don't email me until you do this. If you're emailing me, you're saying, I'm committed to those things as well. I'm committed to my time, I'm committed to my energy, and I'm committed to my finances. Because I think that when you email me with a commitment, I want you to know I'm committed to you too. I'm still going to be committed to everyone else. Don't worry about that. It's not like this is a pay-for-play club, and after you do like level 33 and a half, then you'll know about how the aliens created the world. There'll be a little bit of that, John, wherever you are. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, no, this is just saying I need to know who's rowing the boat with me. And I think the staff's there as well. We want to row, and we're ready to go some places, and we're excited for it. So if you're in, I'm in, and we're going to start building a bigger and better world together. And we're going to heal, and we're going to transform, and I think it happens in this place. You find the same people around you. Would you ask this question? What new clarity do you have for New Abbey? Enjoy. <laughs>